evening and welcome to the December 12, 2013 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm the Chair, Mayor David Narkowitz, and we'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school. Mr. Alden Bourne? Here. Ms. Budaval? Mr. Michael Flynn? Here. Mr. Downey Meyer? Ms. Lisa Minnick? Here. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Ms. Stephanie Pick? Here. Mr. Andrew Shelfo? Here. Mr. Ed Zahowski? Present. And Mayor David Narkowitz? Present. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is the public comment period. If anyone wishes to speak in public comment, we'd ask you to step up to the podium and uh, just state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Jonathan Goldman and uh, 589 Burt's Pit Road in Florence. Should I just go ahead? Sure. Since the loss of a journalism class uh, about six years ago, Northampton High School received a major blow to student opinion and academics. The student interests still exist, NHS continues to lack a journalism class. After the creation of the online Devil's Advocate, student interest in journalism skyrocketed. In less than a week, over 500 students signed a petition in support of a journalism class at NHS, and that's the majority of our high school. Even with Devil's Advocate, NHS is in need of a journalism elective. Unlike other classes, journalism teaches students skills that will be valuable for nearly any profession. Working together to find newsworthy stories, write articles, and create a newspaper teaches students how to work together as a team. And in the process, students learn how to investigate, engage audiences, learn what interests them, and be part of an end product which can change a community. Right now, several students do not have the time to meet twice a week for an hour after school with the devil's advocate. Other students are too busy with homework from their classes to be able to add another project to work on. A journalism class would give students an opportunity to learn the skills needed to write a news article and a, work, and a chance to work on writing in school with a teacher. Other th surrounding schools like South Hadley High School, East Long Meadow High School, Amherst Regional High School, and Ludlow High School that have a newspaper also have a journalism class. And with one quick glance at any of these high school newspapers, it's obvious having a <coughs> journalism class has increased the quality of the newspapers. Undoubtedly, there are enough students at NHS who'd be interested in having a full journalism class. Over the past two weeks, I've met with Mr. Lombardi, Mr. Brennan, Mr. Selfridge, Mr. Italy, and Ms. Moore. Each of these administration members said it's very important to have a journalism class. They also said NHS has been missing a varied and big student voice people will listen to. Without a student voice, how would anyone know what we, the students, really think and feel about issues in our school and town? A journalism class would bring back an important student voice, teach students career skills, give an alternative English elective, provide an academic elective, help modernize NHS, allow students to experience hands-on work. One of the biggest concerns I've heard among both faculty and students is that there isn't staffing or the money to make this happen. Yesterday, along with one of the former journalism teachers, Mr. Mahar, I found 40 plus journalism books that used to be used as part of the journalism class at NHS. These books are in great condi condition and have a lot of valuable information in them. These books would help cover a large portion of the cost that would go into the class. As for staffing, Mr. Italy, Mr. Brennan, Mr. Lombardi all said they think it's possible. Whether Mr. Mahar teaches it again or another te teacher takes on the class, there's definitely a teacher who can make this happen. Having journalism at NHS wouldn't just be adding another class, it would be changing the whole way students can be educated and how students advocate for themselves. I've talked to everyone I can think of and pushed to everything I have to make this happen, and now I'm asking that this class happen and a teacher can choose to teach it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Hearing none, I will now move on to announcements. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Okay. We'll now move into the recommended actions portion of the agenda. And this evening we have a consent agenda before you that it consists of approval of minutes of our school committee meeting of November 14th, 2013. And then we have several contracts. Um, we have a contract with Murphy, Hess, Toomey, and Lahane for $28,000 uh, for legal services related to special education. Uh, Myrick O'Connell, 25000 to amend current legal services contract to resolve ongoing legal personnel matters. The Collaborative for Education Services, $19,480 to provide evaluation and technical assistance to students uh, with the Northampton Prevention Coalition. 
Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn, $37,000 <coughs> to provide general legal services for the balance of the fiscal year on all regular school matters. Now, there's one additional contract that was added on uh, that's not part of the agenda. Uh, that is uh, concerns Tyler Technology or Versatrans, $10,500. Uh, and uh, that concerns uh, consult technical assistance and consulting advisory services and programming for route design on the existing late start time and hub busing to determine feasibility. So uh, then, well, excuse me, there's one other item. Uh, there's also a field trip request uh, for the NHS robotics team uh, traveling to WPI in Worcester March 13th through the 14th uh, of 2014. So that is the consent agenda. Um, is there any, uh, so there's a motion, okay. Could we just pull the, the uh, first the trans out for uh, purpose of discussion? Okay. The, that's the final, the final one. The new one. Okay. So there's been a request to take the last item, the, the other, the last item off the consent agenda for discussion afterwards. Okay. Um, any other items on the consent agenda that people have questions about? Um, so I, there's been a motion made. Is there a second to approve? Seconded by uh, Ms. Pick. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda as, uh, as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now we would move to this other item. Again, this is a $10,500 contract with Tyler Technologies or Versatrans, um, and I wonder uh, who would could speak to that contract. Mr. Mr. McLaughlin. Um, this uh, contract was added this week. Um, as you know, um, we've been charged to look at the late start and the um, feasibility of hub busing and knowing that there are a number of complexities that are involved in addressing this issue. Um, we contacted Versatrans who is our current provider of our software and uh, the time uh, for this particular contract uh, to do this is fairly lengthy. Um, they can dedicate a uh, consulting person who has programming experience to work on redesigning the routes, moving students where they need to be, and making a, a complete change in the, uh, the busing process to look at the, uh, the hub busing or the late bus start combinations thereof to determine um, um, feasibility of, of the um, Transportation. Ms. Minnick. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Where to begin? This, um, when you say hub busing, are you talking about hub busing specifically for high school students? Yes. This would not involve any other age groups? Correct. It involves it to the point where you would have both high school and elementary students on the same bus. And it does involve them <laughs> significantly. Um, so this is not just, you know, bringing all high school students to one place and then doing something with them or, or some other. It, this is putting them on buses with other age children. Correct. I'm so, I, I guess, I'm, I'm starting to question my, my um, sanity and my memory these days because I totally thought that we had decided that we were just turning this over to the high school administration and they were going to figure out how to make it work sometime between 8 and 8.30 or something like that. With the superintendent, could I, could we ask the superintendent to respond because she's been well, leading that effort? We have, and we've had, um, I think, three meetings of all the administrative uh, people who would be involved. There was one representative for the elementary, the middle school principal, and the high school principal. Um, the best that we could come up was with a plan that would affect the start time of not only the high school, but also the elementary and the middle school. It was a plan that none of us liked, but it was the, the only plan that we could come up with. And what it basically meant was that the middle school would be starting much earlier. 
uh, and reversing itself with the high school. Uh, from there, I've had email correspondence um, since I've been here in July um, with one member of a group of, of people who have been prominent in talking about this problem as they see it. And I invited them in to meet with the administrators. I presented a plan. And needless to say, not only did we not like it as administrators, but they certainly didn't like it either. <laughs> From there, we discussed a lot of possibilities, and um, one of the gentlemen at the meeting was willing to come in and um, work with and talk with um, our director of transportation and our business manager about how this might be done. And the theory is that we could do it with hub busing. The problem is that we, as individuals, do not have the skills to put this thing together uh, which may or may not work and may or may, or may not have additional bus costs to it. Um, so we had to look to someone else to help with this. Um, they're, they're quoting 60 hours to do this. So needless to say, the number of hours that these people in the central office have put in, and that includes, I think, your prior superintendent, um, you can see why it's so time consuming and why it's continuing to be time consuming. It's also becoming very costly. And what I said to the group uh, and what I've said to others is if there's a way of doing this without additional costs, no one argues with the research. I think the problem is whether or not we're in the best of all possible worlds, can we pull it off? If we can't, then I'm not going to recommend that we do that and I would ask the board for a reconsideration of their original vote because I just think this is getting extremely expensive but it's not my decision to make but that's the background since I've been here. Thank you. I, I you know, I think we looked at a variety of things that we could do and every time it came up costing us money we said we're not doing that, we, and we finally thought that we had a way that we could adjust times by shortening passing periods and a bunch of other things at the high school, none of, none of which was, as you said, particularly palatable, but we thought it was possible. But none of it involved spending $10,000 to just see if we could do it. And I'm very reluctant to spend $10,000 to find out that we can't make it work without spending another $60,000 on another bus or some other foolishness. And when I say foolishness, I should have used my, I should have chosen my words more carefully. I do, I do agree that this is an important issue and that this is something that members of our community are looking for and I think that there is research to support it, but it if it costs us money that could be used for the new superintendent salary or teachers or supplies or maintenance on our buildings. Um, it, this is it, it, then it becomes in my mind a much larger discussion, which we've been having for nigh on five years. But I don't think we should. I don't think that it should. I, I'm glad it was that someone moved to pull it out of this consent agenda for sure. And I really don't think that it should just be brought to us like this. I think that we needed to be advised that there's that this is the cost just for looking at this whole issue again. Well, all I can tell you, um, Mrs. Binnick, is the fact is that this was a, a contract that we were only aware of this week in terms of the cost of it. I, I so I couldn't I have done it before. I don't mean to cast aspersions or lay blame on something. I'm just saying that I think this is part of a much larger discussion that's been going on for a very long time, and I, I just don't want to see it slipped in. I mean, I think we really have to address it in depth. Ms. Duvall. Feasibility studies. To exp I was on the ad hoc committee, and there was an awful lot of work that went into this, not, uh, I mean, just on the committee. And it just makes sense that we would have to have somebody look at it. And when we were talking about not having it cost us money, um, an additional $60,000, this is a one time expense. It's the same as the MGM and the $22,000 that this for a feasibility study. It's the same as the road studies that we do on Route 66. I mean, we, we have to pay for studies. Um, I'm curious, did you vote for or against in the first place? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out for the for, for passing the, um, for the, for the school start time. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, from where. My uh, position has always been that I'm not opposed to it if it doesn't 
create so it's the same art ship for yeah, someone yeah. for someone else and and that can be a cost to the district or that could be changing school times negative in a neg that creates a negative impact for other age groups right so but my thing is that we've discussed this and and I've heard I've heard your your position and, and I don't think that you're really changing your position any about the it costing money or not costing money but um, if we don't know and don't do a feasibility study, we're not going to know if it does or doesn't, if it's doable or not doable. And it was a long road there. And, and if, if you weren't on board in the first place, then the same objections that you had in the first place are, sim are the same ones. I, fe I think the feasibility now. study was what happened like three years ago and has <laughs> been happening all along. And well, I think we that we, we took a vote that, that we said, could. we took a vote. Unless my memory is incorrect, and I'd be happy for someone to tell me that the minutes reflect something completely different, but I thought we took a vote that said that we were going to make it happen this year. The high school administration was going to figure out what the exact start time would be that would work within the, the existing bus schedules and routes, and that that was their marching orders. It wasn't to have a feasibility study for later start time. It was to make later start time happen by next September. I understand that, but it's also asking an awful lot of our administrators well, to do that when you're looking at 60 but, hours being quoted to us for them to be taking that time to do it. So. I, I think... Um, if, if I might, in reading the minutes, because I was not here, um, when the school committee took the vote to do it, the override had not passed. And at that point, there was not busing for the high school. And when there was no busing <coughs> for the high school, it was not an issue. We certainly could have made it happen. When the override passed, which gave us back busing for the high school, it became a different issue because we now have to be concerned about the tiered busing that we have, the fact that we have elementary, middle school, and high school, and how we're going to interwork all of those with the small number of buses that we currently have. I believe we've gone from 14 at one point in this district down to nine. So at the time the board approved it, it was not an issue because busing was not happening at the high school. Ms. Pick. Um, that's true, and I think it was after the vote when the principal of the high school came to us and said, let, let us work this out in our building and we will come back to you. And and uh, my memory is, is just as Lisa's that, that this has been a decision. But part of our discussion also was that we were going to be apprised along the way of what was going on, that they, that the, that there was going to be a committee who was going to look at this and come back and report to us. So I agree with Lisa that to vote on this without, you know, um, having heard the benefit of, of that committee coming forward to us and, and sharing what, what their thinking is seems a little premature. Um, I agree that to, to spend over $10,000 on a feasibility study when we were not wanting to spend a large sum of money on making the change doesn't, doesn't appear to um, make sense to me right off the bat. I won't, I'm not saying that it wouldn't if I didn't hear more, but I would suggest that we not vote on this tonight and that that committee come and talk to the school committee about what they're thinking is, what they've, what they've looked at, what, you know, what they're thinking is. Um, because we were led to believe that it was, you know, that the high, the high school really wanted to work on it themselves. Brian said, you know, let us talk to my, let me talk to my staff, let us work this out, and we will come back to you with, with what our thinking is. And we haven't, we haven't been apprised along the way. I would be happy to do that at the next meeting. And it's a plan that we did present to the group of people who have been working on this uh, from the community. It's not a plan that the administration will recommend, but it's the best plan we can put forward. Uh, we feel that it's not appropriate for all of the students. I'm happy to present that. I'm happy to have the administrators here who worked on that plan. Um, I think perhaps the, the group of um, people who have been prominent in terms of this discussion may also wish to come. Uh, I have met with them, um, and we don't seem to agree on uh, what we have before us. So I have no problems doing that, and if you'd like to have the other group join us, that's, that would be fine too, and that's up to the school committee. <coughs> uh, and I just have a practical question. Are, are we buying the software to use after 
they're done with that 60 hours or are we just buying the 60 hours for us to use the software? We have the software. We own the, we so own the software. The software okay. we own, we've owned the software for quite a period of time. This is for their expertise to move, manipulate the data to see uh, and reprogram data to see if these uh, proposals will work within the parameters that have been uh, taken out of our last couple of meetings. So there were start times, there were end times, there were length of routes, there was much discussion. All of that information has been passed on to the programmer consultant. So it's we're paying for their time to take that data that came out of our meeting and then use all of the um, student database that's in our Versatrans and, and move that and see how that works with the number of students, the mileage, the times, the beginning of school, the ending of school to make that uh, to work, to come back to us to say um, this can work or this can't work. So this is just a little bit beyond what our normal users of Versatrans can do? Is that the idea? Oh, oh, it's, a, it's a lot beyond what we can do. Okay. It's, it's just for us, it just it would be so time consuming. This is what they do. Okay. They're the experts at this. They're, this is a Versatrans software uh, staff member. Okay. So this is what they do in its 60 hours for $10,000? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh -huh. Wow. That's a lot of money per hour. $15 an hour. $15. So, um, they charge $175 an hour. So, um, are there other questions or comments about this particular contract? Um, I guess, no, other than just that I think this just goes to show the very nature of the problem that we've always had with the school start time, that it's very complex and that uh, <coughs> Joy Winnie, our transportation coordinator. She's, you know, tried to do her very best to figure it out, but even at that, you know, and no due respect to Mr. Moore, he, I think it's his idea of the hub system that is the catalyst for this, and it has merit, uh, unfortunately. I mean, we can see that if a private company is coming in and they're claiming it could take up to 60 hours to kind of figure it out, um, that it isn't probably as easy as uh, one might think and that it's going to take some time to really to look at to figure out to do it right, right. and so um, I, yeah I'd like to speak to that I think one of, the, one of my real motivations about behind this whole hub system is you, if you recall um, less than a year ago we passed a budget that eliminated transportation to the high school entirely eliminated it. and um, that was so that we could save a couple of professional positions in the district you know it's really a trade-off and um, probably in a, another three or four years, we'll be in a similar posi position in terms of making a budget decision about transportation to the high school or a couple of professional positions. So um, if you look at, if you, again, if you look at what we've done, what Joy, what Joy has done really under budget pressure in terms of reducing the number of buses there are, right now at the elementary and JFK, for a bunch of reasons, they can't get fewer buses, okay? Um, mostly it's not about seats, it's about route length. But those buses are still pretty full. The high school, on the other hand, has gone, just last year, went from nine buses to five buses, which had a huge impact on route length. Um, it, it, and it was okay in the morning because they were the first route of the day. Um, this feels, like, this feels like we're kind of wandering into a long really conversation. Are, but that is but I, just wanna, I just want to, it is a long conversation. I think a couple of people have said this is a long conversation. Um, but one of the things that happens, that, that, but that's five buses is the smallest number that you can possibly do. And with that, you're either at, um, <clears throat> we're running about 100 students to 150 students at very maximum on those five buses. So we have, we're ending up with like two, or three buses worth of excess capacity, but we can't get a fewer number of buses because, because the route lengths would become ridiculous. So, we, so, so what's going on in there in terms of squeezing efficiencies out of our transportation system is that we've squeezed as much as we can by reducing the number of buses on, the, on each tier of the three tiers. And um, that's really good. <laughs> 
the, the point is that there's no more to do in, by doing it that way. And so the only way to get more efficiency out of that would be to take the smallest tier, which is the high school tier, and combine it with either the, high, the JFK or the elementary tiers, so you're not running a lot of excess capacity on a tier. And so from my perspective, I, well, I think that I, I am stunned that this costs this much. <laughs> um, but, you know, because it seems to me that it should be more or less just data entry, like entering in addresses of riders into a piece of software. Um, so I'm a little concerned that it costs that much. It seems like if we don't take spend some money now to figure out if we can get a more efficient transportation system, that we're going to be in a two or three, four years back to the thing of saying, well, we're not going to try and make it more efficient, we're going to eliminate it. And I think that was terrible. I think it was a bad decision. But it, but it was the only decision. I mean, it was, it was not, we were not wrong to do it, but it was a bad decision to have to, to choose between two professional positions and transportation to the high school. So I'm in the position of saying, if, if in fact this is what it costs to do it to see if we could get a more efficient transportation system, then it's worth it even though it's more than I think we ought to have to spend on, on doing it. Could, could I just ask a question or maybe just a comment? Um, what I'm sensing here is that probably Versatran systems are probably just set up for the standard, you know, route system that most districts have, you know, two tier, three tier, or just, or one tier, you know, whatever it is, and that I'm assuming I don't know what kind of research you've done. Yeah. Um, are there other? No, I don't know if there are other. Are there other hub systems? Well, it sounds like we're attempting well, something that's probably a little bit outside the box, which is probably why it requires some programming to make the system. Except I don't see that it really is more complex because if instead of thinking of it as a hub, you just thought of it as you ran a tier to, to say an elementary school or, a, or to JFK, whatever, wherever your hub was. Um, it's just, and you just put in all the people who were riding, the, the, it doesn't seem like the program would care whether they were in, you know, eighth grade or ninth grade or tenth grade, you know, what grade they were in. You just put in those addresses mm -hmm. and it should be able to tell you, you know, what routes would look like. I don't, I don't really understand, I don't, I guess I don't understand, um, and then you would, then we, then we would add those up, I mean, you know, because we already know what our, you know, <laughs> what our relevant areas yeah. are for our school. So I, I'm, I'm a little, that's why I'm a little confused by that. So uh, the question before you then is, uh, does the school committee want to approve this contract tonight? Uh, what What's the, um, <coughs> I don't know, have we had a motion? It was taken off of the consent was, agenda, was but I don't believe we've actually had a motion to do something with it to approve or not approve, did you? But it would su I would I would suggest that you consider um, having the committee come and talk to us as the superintendent said that she would be happy to have them do before you vote on this and, and have a better understanding of what it is you're actually voting on what it is that this the, these um, experts would be able to offer because as as Lisa already said to spend ten thousand five hundred dollars and then find out we can't come up with the plan it seems not a good use of, of money. Um, if, if we're going to spend ten thousand five hundred dollars, I want to know that there's a, a plan coming out of it. That yes, we're going to be able to make make good on the vote that we took and move forward. So I think it would make sense to table this <coughs> to next month to hear more before you vote on this contract. And I, so I, I, don't I say, would state that as a motion. So you. that's a motion to motion. to postpone consideration that. until the next meeting. Well, okay. And I'll second that. And. Um, I just think that, especially with the questions that Howard brings up, that there's a lot of unanswered questions um, as far as what we're actually spending the money for and what we're going to be getting for it. So I'd rather have everybody know and and, and make a decision based on knowledge. Okay. So. so there's been a motion made and seconded to postpone consideration of this contract until the next meeting of the school committee. Um, any further discussion on that motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that will come back to you, well, some of you, uh, at your next meeting. Um, the next item on the agenda uh, is our uh, reports. Uh, and uh, we have a uh, first report uh, this evening is from our trio of student representatives, um, Emily Stamm, Dylan Weaver, and Maddie Kahlane. 
So I will uh, turn the floor over to you for the student report. So hello again, I'm Dylan Weaver. And we're seniors at NHS. Um, just recently, uh, to give you an update on our stuff because we're seniors, is that uh, Seniors One Booster Week, which means our class got a lot of money. Um, and having to do with that, uh, seniors have also just recently been doing a lot of fundraising. Um, we are really excited to have a snowball winter, winter formal, which is the first time we've had a winter formal since our freshman year. Mm -hmm. And that's like next week, it's really exciting. And um, that's going to be at the Northampton Country Club. And then the theater department has been very busy. We just had our production of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, and that was very successful. And on, in the second week of January, we will be having the One X. And then in, as far as sports goes, the winter sports season has just started. Um, as far as the arts are concerned, the chorus and chamber choir had a concert with other schools tonight at the Helen Hills Chapel. Um, just a few weeks ago, we had a local musician touring with an African percussive group come to our school to perform, and that was um, very, like, quite an experience, actually. Um, the Poetry Slam happened this week. The winner was a freshman, Gemma Fisher. Um, the Devil's Advocate newspaper started up recently, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, and the petition for a new journalism class has gone through quite successfully. Just recently, like in this past week, um, the Smith classes have stopped for us, which means that this week and next week we are going to have finals for the people who, for the NHS students who are involved in the academics at Smith. Um, we're really lucky this year uh, as a happy circumstance of this budget crisis you guys are talking about. Um, some classes got cut at, at our school and so there are more than a usual amount of seniors and juniors got the amazing opportunity to take classes at Smith. So that was an amazing experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that report. Okay, we'll now turn to um, a discussion uh, regarding the um, matter of uh, an interim superintendent. Uh, and I know at our last meeting uh, we had a discussion about, um, about uh, conducting a search for an interim superintendent um, uh, because we were at the halfway point of um, Superintendent Nash's uh, uh, contract, and uh, s but um, I think we found a candidate who can uh, <laughs> fill out the rest Yay. of the term uh, that we're quite pleased about. Um, we're, we're very pleased that in the intervening time, uh, Superintendent Nash has um, is, is um, now able to stay on with us for the remainder of the school year, um, and uh, and I'll let her speak to that, but. Um, in, in keeping with the contract that was signed originally, there was this point in January um, where we would reassess. And I think one of the, just one of the items um, which we had been, uh, we had been planning to raise at this point anyway was the issue of um, adjusting the compensation to be in line with what was budgeted for the superintendent um, uh, line item in our budget this year going forward, not retroactive, but from January on to the, uh, <coughs> school year um, so I, I will uh, turn the floor over to the superintendent to discuss this to discuss um, her staying on but I, I would hope that we could have um, it's a motion tonight to approve her staying on that would incorporate that modification uh, to the contract which was um, which again was uh, anticipated as, as a possible discussion as part of that contract so I'll turn it over to superintendent Thank Nash. You. Um, I just want to say that life is filled with surprises, and some of them are pleasant and some of them are not. Um, because of personal reasons, I was planning to leave Northampton as of January 1st, and therefore I requested that the board look at an interim superintendent um, position to follow me for the rest of the year. Um, I'm happy to say that after follow-up medical appointments last week in Virginia, I received one of the pleasant surprises of life, and that is that I have been off the wait and see list, uh, and apparently I am in good health, and uh, I look forward to remaining in Northampton uh, as the interim superintendent for the remainder of the school year, if that's the wish of the school committee. 
Um, I think we've taken a lot of new initiatives this year in working with the people in Northampton, um, and I'd like to see them through. I would also like to see through the issue of the late start. Um, that's something that I think we need to resolve this year, finally, one way or another, so that we don't continue taking time and energy uh, out of the people in the central office and out of the school committee and other people in the community um, talking about it. We need to make a decision. Um, I think the Northampton School District has many good things for it going for it, and one of the most important things are the people who are here. The people who are actually your employees are doing a fantastic job. They are committed to the student body. Um, they really care about what happens with education and with the kids who are here. And I think they're making uh, tremendous strides in putting forth good educational practices in the classroom. So my feeling is it would be both a pleasure and a privilege for, for me to continue uh, supporting the employees in this district in their efforts to provide that quality education for all of our students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ball. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion to um, ask, or I'm not sure exactly how to word, but to accept um, Dr. Nash as the continuing interim superintendent. And I would also like to make a motion to amend the salary to reflect the current salary that we're offering and the salary that she asked for, um, raising it from 455 per diem to 514 per diem. Okay. Um, so this would essentially con continue the existing contract that we have in place um, and amend that rate um, to, f to uh, 514 per diem. Mm -hmm. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay, second. Discussion, comments? And as I've already um, told the superintendent, I'm delighted for Northampton that she is able to stay. I think it's, I think, um, it's, it's best for Northampton to reduce the number of positions, especially while they have one that um, is working. And I'm certainly heard from the administrator that they're very pleased um, in working with Dr. Nash. And um, I'm grateful um, for your news for you and that you are willing and able to stay with us. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Um, hearing none, um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so um, the next item on the agenda, speaking of um, superintendencies, uh, we have a presentation this evening um, from Nesdek, who is our consultant on the... Um, skipped one. Oh, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe my... Oh, I spoke the other way. No, he's oh. right. Uh, I believe that's the, the most updated. I guess I do. My yeah. apologies. So, um, so I would like to introduce uh, um, Mr. Arthur Betancourt, who's the executive director of Nesdek. Um, to uh, introduce himself and his team that's here tonight um, to talk with us about our upcoming uh, superintendent search. Um, if you'd like to address from the podium, that would be great, just because of the camera and the microphones. We're happy to do that. Okay. Good evening to you all. I am here with uh, Dr. Bill Erickson, whom many of you know and uh, Dr. Carolyn Burke, Hi. and myself, Art Betancourt. I'm the Executive Director of uh, the New England School Development Council, NESDEC, and uh, both Bill and Carolyn are senior search associates that work, uh, work for our firm. And uh, I'm here to talk about continuing your search um, and uh, discuss with you the means by which we may do that in terms of uh, the sorts of things you'd like to see and the kinds of things we can recommend. Uh, let me say, first of all, that uh, one of the more pleasant uh, things that happened to me this week is that I had a telephone conversation with your, super, your interim superintendent. Uh, and she informed me that there was a possibility that she was staying on longer uh, during the period that we might be doing this search. And I think that's a very positive piece of, of the whole process in terms of uh, doing the search and, and bringing it to conclusion um, in the in the spring or late spring. I think that uh, lends a lot of stability uh, to to the process, 
and uh, also gives us someone that, that I uh, obviously we know Regina and, and know of her know of her work and uh, I think that helps the whole process a great deal so that was good news for us too um, what we have done for you is to put together a, uh, a packet and our thought was unless you're thinking differently our thought was to start right off today hit, hitting the ground running making some decisions and moving ahead with the search is, does that meet with your expectations okay. Okay. Ms. Minnick, you have a question? I, I do. I'm, I'm looking at what the, the typical, the overview of what you're going to, what you typically cover in this kind of a session. I assume that it's what we got from you. Yeah, it looks like the stuff that's right inside. And um, it just, it occurs to me, I, I don't want to delay the process, but by the same token, tonight is the last meeting for several of our members, and in January we will have three new ones. And they will obviously be part and parcel of the group that's really <coughs> making a decision. I'd love for them to be able to be, I, I think there are some decisions that this group could reasonably make, but I think to the extent that we're talking about roles and responsibilities and training, if you will, of what, what our job is going to be going forward, I, I almost think you'd be better served. I hate to make you drive again, but I almost think you'd be better served to come back after those people are in place so that they can hear what's required of them. May I respond? Sure. sure. Uh, if you wish to proceed that way, that's fine. That's, that's clearly up to the, to the school committee. Um, I would suggest to you that what we have this evening is uh, the, the things that we need to talk with you about just to get the word out and that the actual process in terms of what you do as a school committee in terms of organizing yourselves uh, and certainly the selection process that unfolds um, is something that can be, that can be dealt with in, in much more detail and would be dealt with in much more detail probably even mid to late January. I mean, okay. I think it, it goes that far out. So I think we can, we can accomplish both, but I'm happy to, to go whatever way you folks would like us to go. I wasn't suggesting that you should leave. <laughs> I was simply I saying I that <laughs> some of the decisions, I, obviously some of the stuff that we need to decide sure. needs to be decided now. I just wanted to, to be clear that, I, that you shouldn't make, uh, you shouldn't be saying things tonight that you're just going to have to repeat for a new group okay. in, in a month or two. Well, so, that's fine. That's okay. fine. And we're happy to come back on any number of occasions and probably should come back on any number of occasions uh, as you hit certain milestones in the search. Okay. To discuss what you've accomplished as a as a committee and, and then what needs to be accomplished, um, if that you can talk sense. to Bill after you I confirm say that also. I'm a troublemaker. So just actually, I met you before. I knew <laughs> that before I came. <laughs> Great, perfect. A couple of you I remember. Um, so I, I guess the first thing to, to start off with is is to say that we're. We're very happy to to continue the search and to be working with you. And it is just part and parcel of what we do. We stand behind our work. We know that things uh, don't always work in terms of the way you'd like them to. Um, and that uh, what we feel we can do is be there when you need us. And that's what this is all about. Um, I'd also say that as we go through the various elements of the search, and certainly my colleagues, um, uh, I hope, will, will contribute as well. Um, the, the bottom line for us is that this is your search. It's not our search. And so we're here to help you and to assist you and in, in ways that we can to, to make this search suitable in terms of your expectations, the culture you have within your committee, and, the way that, and, and your vision of how things should unfold. Uh, so what I've done, which was already mentioned, is I put together a, 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 just a very brief outline uh, of the search process, uh, or rather of the, the discussion that we might have tonight. And I would suggest to you that if, if we say something and there's a question that emerges, if it's, if it's uh, okay with the chair, that, uh, that we would answer that question in the course of the conversation? Yeah. Okay. Um, since you've, you've gone through this process before, I think there are some elements already in place that we need not repeat. Um, you've gone through an extensive community input process. Uh, that community input process resulted in a candidate profile. Um, all of those things, unless you feel otherwise, or both of those things, unless you feel otherwise, I think are, are reasonably current and therefore um, probably do not require a lot of 
redoing in, in that area. But that's something to think about. Um, we're going in the assumption that, that we can hit the road getting the word out, knowing what the community expectations are from your, your um, community needs assessment and from your candidate profile. Um, was that your expectation, perhaps? I'm seeing shaking heads, yes? Yes. Okay, okay. So one of the things, having that in place, um, one of the things that we would really like to do is to establish the lines of communication with you and us. What we would like, if it's at all possible, is to have one person <coughs> that we deal with who communicates with us and also communicates back to the committee. That person might also be someone that is authorized to make some of the more non-substantive, if you will, decisions, time, schedule changes, minor time changes, minor things in the, in the, the search process that might be necessary uh, to do in order to keep the search on track. So the first thing I would ask is whether you think you're prepared this evening to, to assign a liaison or whether that's something that you, you would like to, to consider later on and get back to us. Well, I think at our last meeting when we had a discussion, I believe we had um, indicated that the vice chair would serve as liaison at this point. So I, that was my sense of the discussion we had last time. So Mr. Zahowski, who's the vice chair, okay. um, is would be our liaison. Okay. And what we will need to do, obviously, is, is uh, give each other contact information so that we can make contact with you. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. I okay. would only ask the committee if there would be a problem in the event that at the January meeting when we um, kind of do our housekeeping, if we move to elect a new vice chair, and that <laughs> wouldn't be me, if, You're I, not getting it, out of it. if I'm, ju I'm just wondering if um, it would be in <coughs> favor of the committee to have a uh, liaison that would potentially not be the vice chair. That's all. I don't think that's a problem. You, <laughs> you think you're getting out of it? Um, <laughs> So we'll exchange Try. contact information. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll uh, give each other contact information uh, as the evening unfolds. Um, that's terrific. Now, the other thing that we would would like to get squared away right away is the spokesperson for the search. Typically, NESDEC does not speak for the search. As I mentioned to you before, it isn't our search, it's your search. Um, so we would ask you to think about the search actually in two phases. Um, the spokesperson for the search during the preliminary phase is typically someone who is also dealing with the screening committee, uh, assuming that you are going to, uh, to create a screening committee. And then after the preliminary screening process, that role typically uh, moves to, actually typically moves to the chair of the committee or to a designee of the chair who would then um, uh, designate the person who would in fact um, be the, the person who keeps the public informed, speaks with the press, that sort of thing. So in this interim period where we're in the, the preliminary stages, would we assume that the liaison would be the communicator with the public or did you have something else in mind perhaps? I, I believe that's correct, yeah. Okay. So when we get calls, for example, from the press, our response would be we are not the spokesperson people for your search, you are free to call. Is that correct? Everybody That's correct. agree with that? Okay. Great. Do you agree with that, Barbara? <laughs> <laughs> it's the press. So there you go. <laughs> Which means you probably don't want to call us. You probably want to call him, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for that. That that actually, although it's it seems like a little thing, is a very important thing to a search because we need to know how to communicate right off the bat. So, and, and it's not always as easily done as it was this evening. So, thank you for that. Um, on the right hand side of the folder, we've taken the time to put together uh, a search timeline. And what this does is it maps out the major milestones in the search, and it uh, also uh, indicates who is responsible for getting to that milestone or achieving that milestone, if you will. Uh, this document typically is a living document in that as the search unfolds, sometimes things have to change in the schedule. For example, the meeting schedule of the screening committee that you put together may not fit exactly with the way we have it here. Uh, candidate interviews may have to be accelerated or, or lengthened out in order to get the job done that you need to. But this represents, I think, a framework for you to, to think about as you're moving forward. We're assuming 
that the uh, anticipated start date is July 1 or thereabouts. And so um, we, uh, assuming that we can, we can move this right along, we're assuming that if we can get the announcement letter, which is actually in here, um, and all of our outreach materials approved very quickly, we can have the word out on your search very quickly. Uh, and if that is the case, we could have a, an application deadline of February 14 for applications, which is just before, you're taking a February vacation, yes? Okay, just before your February vacation. That would give our office an opportunity to take all of those applications, organize them, copy them, get them ready for the screening committee. And uh, assuming that your screening committee would not want to meet during that February vacation week, we see the first meeting of your screening committee uh, on the 24th of February. Now let's stop there and just maybe back up a little bit and ask you, have you thought about whether or not in fact you want a screening committee for this search? Have you discussed that at all, the, the implications? I believe we did discuss it at our last meeting and we were um, open to any further guidance about that. Okay. Um, we just, obviously we've come off of a search where we had a screening committee yeah. that's been the custom. Okay. So I believe that would be the, um, the approach that we okay. would take. And we can help you with that further on in this, this discussion if you like. Okay. So what we, would, what we would suggest to you is on or about that date of February 24th would be the first meeting of your screening committee. It is at that meeting that we would go through the training necessary. Uh, develop the protocols, develop the prompts, develop the interview questions. Then we would provide the applications for the screening committee on that evening, ask them to take those applications home, review them, and come back for a second meeting very shortly where that screening committee would determine the candidates that it wished to interview. And then from that process, go through the interview process, uh, interviewing any number of candidates that the screening committee feels appropriate with the idea that at the end of that screening committee process, the screening committee would be prepared to recommend three to five candidates to the full school committee for further consideration. The, um, the preliminary screening process, which is the screening, pretty, uh, screening committee's uh, <coughs> process, typically occurs mostly in executive session. Um, once those finalists, and you've been through this before, so you probably have seen this happen, once those finalists or those candidates um, who are sent forward for further consideration are named, um, then, the, public, then the, the process becomes a public one, and that's where the school committee takes over. Virtually all of your work as a school committee uh, with those final candidates is done in public. Interviews, visits, all of that is done uh, in the public setting. Assuming all goes well, um, you could be, school committee could be interviewing uh, its finalists uh, toward the end of March, perhaps earlier if the screening committee decides that it can accelerate its work. But we're looking at a March time frame for the school committee to, um, to be interviewing and, and um, reviewing candidates. Now that usually involves the candidates coming to your district, visiting your district, speaking with your staff, interviewing and with the school committee in the evening. Um, it also uh, typically involves, although not always, involves uh, visits to the candidates present school districts. And you can decide whether or not you want that to happen as you move down toward that date. What is important, I think, for the screening committee to, to sort of bear, in, uh, for the school committee rather, to bear in mind is that this March time frame for a school committee is a very intense time usually for, for school committees. Uh, when do you approve your budget, for example? March, April? May. Um, so there's a lot going on. So um, although I wouldn't be asking you to schedule your time now, as you think about the, the tasks that are coming up for you in the March-April time frame, this is one more that is extremely time consuming and um, one that, you, that if, you, if you possibly can, you, you need to build it into your thinking as you build your schedule going forward for those other things that you have to do during that time of year. In general, that's what we have worked out for the timeline. Is, does that timeline uh, seem to, to make sense to you at this point, understanding that there can be changes made? Okay. The, uh, the next sheet in your, your folder um, is, the, is an updated 
version of the original announcement that you had. Now, one of the things that uh, Regina and I spoke about was um, the salary range that you were offering uh, for this search. Has formal action been taken on that salary range? You have. Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, Regina, it's on the second page about halfway down. Is it quoted correctly? Is that what you, is that what we talked about? Okay. So we have a salary range. Um, Ms. Minnick. Troublemaker. Okay. Alert. <laughs> Alden's laughing because he knows Not exactly laughing. what I'm going to say. His motion was that we make that be the range that we are offering, but we decided not to advertise it. No, no. Actually, we no. decided to <laughs> defer to the judgment of NASDAQ. Okay. So is it, in your opinion, the best course of action for us to advertise that salary range? It is. <clears throat> Can you speak to that a bit? Since well, it takes the mystery out of it, frankly. Um, and candidates know where you stand and they know where they stand. Um, if it's, it's a negotiable, uh, which, we, which we do a lot, um, and you did that the last time, in fact. Um, although we can speak for what we think and what we've been authorized to say to the candidates, you don't really know until you get into the negotiations with the candidate what it's going to be. So I think here it's up front. Candidates for whom this salary <clears throat> makes sense in that, in that particular portion of the path of their career, I think no, and um, would be more would, would be more apt to uh, to come in to the search, knowing that in the end. Um, it's a search where they can buy into it from their side and that they feel you can buy into it from your side. But it works both ways. I will have to tell you, we do it both ways. Um, and it's a judgment call. But I, I think in the case of, of this search, where we're redoing the search, uh, where we're developing a new applicant pool, um, and where I think this, this salary is, is attractive uh, as part of a package, uh, I think it works in your favor, but that's just my point of view. Any, any thoughts? You disagree, I know, but or perhaps, <laughs> but maybe okay. I don't know. <laughs> okay. okay. So, uh, so are you asking for our approval of this document in terms of being able to then um, begin the posting process? Is that the well? You could do it that way, or you could authorize your liaison okay. uh, to finalize this document with us. It, okay. it, I think it should be pretty close. Yeah. Um, but I think what would be good is if we gave folks a few days to look at it in case there's something that has changed that we're not aware of uh, or something that isn't, isn't framed uh, as, as you would like it to be framed. And then we can deal with the liaison in terms of saying to us you're authorized to go with it um, and if that meets okay. with your approval. Okay. When you said this was updated, can, were there other changes other than just specifying the salary, or is this essentially the same letter that went out the last time? I think it's the same with respect, with everything except the, the salary range included and the starting date. Okay, so, I mean, you didn't revise any of the pros that describe no, the district no, or anything like think, that. Okay. I didn't think that's what you wanted me to do. So. Okay, I just didn't know if I had to be reading for content here. Or well, I think it's really to read con for content to ensure that what was said back then is true now. I mean, if, there, if anything has changed in the in the interim, um, but I don't, I doubt it. So I recently, know. I can't yeah. imagine that it's changed no, in I six months. Sure. Okay. But it wouldn't hurt to take a look at it so that you know for sure. Okay, thank you. So and then, again, Mr. Chairman, we would work with the with the liaison. Yes. So I think I would ask if um, if folks find any issues or concerns with this, uh, they could just transmit them to the um, to the liaison. Authorized to just give the green light to go ahead with it. If that's, that's, that's and what I would also, I would just add to that if you would do the homework this weekend and let me know by Monday. We are coming up on the holiday season, and I'd certainly like to get guidance and conversation with NESDEC prior to um, 
uh, the end of next week. So if you have any concerns, if you'd share with me probably early, early next week, like Monday, and then I can make a call by mid next week at the latest. Uh, the next document uh, that I have, uh, again, on the right side of your folder is the application form. It's a typical application form. We would just insert the, uh, the due date. Uh, and uh, this is the same. It's, uh, it's our typical form, and it's the same form we used the last time. So I, I don't know that you would want any changes, but it's, it's there if you, if you do. So last time when we were discussing this, we talked about wanting to have a statement, and I don't know if it belongs in the profile or the letter or both, about um, superintendency experience preferred but not required. I don't know exactly what the wording was. I think that was the wording. That yeah. was the wording. Um, and so that's not in here yet because that would be new. But I'm not sure where that would be. It could be either both or either. Whichever you choose. It does say a doctorate is considered desirable but not required. Superintendent, Superintendent experience. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Discussed last time. Okay. So that you'd, like, you'd like a statement? Perhaps we can wait to. But perhaps you're talking about a statement about superintendent experience preferred but not required. Correct. A central, maybe central office experience preferred but not required, or superintendent experience. There's a difference. There is a difference. We had a long discussion about it. Okay. <laughs> sorry to bring it up again. <laughs> no, no, no. It's important. Yes. I'd say superintendent. I, 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 I think it was superintendency is what we what we that, that was what we so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll square that away in our exactly. discussion with the ladies. Okay. Uh, the other item that um, we thought you would want to talk about, and, and we mentioned it before, is the screening committee. And uh, first of all, whether or not you want to use a screening committee, and we established pretty much that you have, and then how you might want to go forward with that. Uh, what we have here is a, is a, uh, a description or, or a guide uh, for the typical screening committee. Um, how can we best help you in terms of how we address that issue? Did you have questions in mind how, how you would like that to go? Ms. Pick. Um, actually, in our discussion last month, um, I'm Stephanie Pick. I, I've been on the, on the our recent three searches. I was the chair for each of those, so um, I'm a little opinionated. Um, <laughs> last time we had a discussion about whether or not we would invite the members from our last search com uh, screening committee to serve again, and there was some debate about whether it would be best to start fresh or to use. Um, the same people who are already trained and experienced and kind of invested, and we, were, we thought we would ask you what you thought about that. I don't think I have an opinion, actually. I, th I think it's up to you in terms of your judgment as to the best way to, to put the committee together, those individuals that will perform the task in, in the way that you want it done. So I, I don't think I feel comfortable weighing in on that, actually. So we, we did some work in both the two years ago and in the last search. To, um, to have a, a committee that could represent various interests in the, in the community from you know, um, administrators and staff in all, at all three levels and parents and um, uh, outside community members and somebody from the SPED pack and all of that. Um, they, I, I don't even know how many of them are interested in doing it again. It would be my thought, having worked with them and, and finding them to be a good working committee, it would be my thought to invite them um, to, to see if what their interest is in serving again. And then for whoever would not be interested, figure out what, where the gaps are in terms of the interests that were represented there um, and, try to, and try to fill the positions um, that way. Um, what I would offer. I can understand where where um, Ms. Pick is coming from as far as wanting um, the because they're, they're being trained, but I also think that it wasn't a successful search. So I mean, the screening committee had what they had, but it wasn't as though they did you know presented a successful search and there was an issue there. I don't hold a lot of value in, in maintaining the same screening committee. Um, I hold value in main, in 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 trusting. The chairman to assign another committee that um, is well-rounded, that represents the different factions, and for people who are interested. And I received, um, you know, letters, um, emails actually, from people last time that were upset that they weren't considered for the screening committee. So um, they didn't feel that the pro that they were even considered was the, was their problem that I had. I, I can speak to that, and I can tell 
you that the mayor and I sat together and we reviewed all of the letters that came in. There were certainly plenty of people who who um, heard that was in the it was in the paper. It was on our website. It was announced in our meeting several times that people who were interested could apply to be on the committee. We had um, many people apply and we vetted them and we. Um, came up with a committee and I would say that we were actually a very successful committee in how we worked together and I don't think success is only measured in the final outcome right I would agree with that and I, and I but I also do think that just because you had something that worked well together doesn't mean that we can't have something else that works well together I, mean, I think the goal is to have the best screening committee we can have so if there are people who are on the previous committee that you think are good at what they do, then we should invite them back. And if there are holes left after we do that, then we should look for other people. I mean, I think it could be a mix of old people and new people, yeah. but just mm -hmm. put together the best screening committee we can. I mean, hopefully we're dealing with grown-ups who understand what we're trying to do. Pretty grown-up committee. Thank you. So we would have it, we, I think, my, my, my um, preference would be to do what we did before, which is just open it up to, the, to applications from mm -hmm. the community and Past members could apply as well as new mm -hmm. members, and we'll just have to assess the pool that we have of candidates. So, um, what was? The, do you remember the final size of the committee we had last time? Um, I think it was eleven. So, um, so just right. I, I think we would probably try to shoot for that same range. So, um, and you're suggesting that this uh, call goes out um, in. We're suggesting that you would want your screening committee named and, and together, ready to, to come together for a meeting. Uh, I'm in February. Okay, okay. So probably in sometime in January, we sure. can begin a call for that same. Okay. Another, another way of, of doing that, and it sometimes is a combination of, of both, is to, is to actually go to a constituency and have that constituency recommend someone or a couple of people for you to we actually to, did that with this back. to think yeah. about okay um, rather we, than we open it that. all up but you can do it either way okay. I mean, sometimes it's it's less cumbersome and, that and that sometimes sure. works but it's up to you folks okay. <laughs> if you want to talk about that offline with with us you can call yeah. us and we'll we'll we help did you that work. in some cases yeah. during this last committee yeah. um, I think that so makes sense. Um, okay so, and uh, I'm sorry I would just to the the committee um, as a whole I, um, Mr. Pick, if you could just remind me, I think, um, of the committee that served on the last search committee, it was yourself and Ms. Carlson were the only two returning from the previous search we did. So although you did reach out to everybody, um, not everybody came back from that previous search committee as well. So I guess I only bring it up because I, th I think that there may be community members out there that might feel like if we uh, make an appeal to the previous search committee to come back that there would be no opportunity to, to uh, find a seat on the search committee. I would imagine that there will be people just because of conflicts in the time of year that won't be able to, although they would like to join us again, they won't be able to. So I think there'll be ample opportunity for, for new blood, so to speak, to come on and be part of the group. That's probably fair, right? And I think there's some value to having veteran members on there as well. Okay. The other thing we would suggest you would consider, you, you are, I'm assuming, I'm hearing, I think that you're having school committee members on your screening committee. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. yeah. We think that's a good idea. We, we would go one step further and suggest to you that those school committee members uh, be your leadership figures of that screening committee. I don't know how you did it last time, but that, exactly how we did it. that tends to work well. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I also offer you, uh, Mr. Mayor, that uh, sometimes Staying with the 11 people is difficult. And you, you need to go higher or lower or whatever. We're we're happy to, to work with that, whatever number you put before us uh, okay. uh, to ensure that you get the, the representation uh, uh, on that screening committee that you're looking for. Okay. Uh, also, want to bring to your attention um, and make clear to you the last the last page of the screening committee document is a memorandum from our attorney, uh, Jean Colachico, uh, regarding the potential conflict of interest when you're putting together a screening committee. Have you talked about this before? Has this been brought to your attention before? We discussed it, I believe. Okay. There is the potential for conflict of interest, particularly when you're looking at school funding 
employees being placed on the screening committee. The conflict comes can arise as a result of the superintendent having virtual full authority over hiring and firing of certain individuals in your in your district without school committee approval. Those folks who are in direct line, uh, in the direct line of authority, and I would suggest to you that, that those folks that aren't quite in the direct line but are in a line of authority to your, your next superintendent should sign a disclosure statement uh, and that you have that on file. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very important thing to do, I think, in, in terms of the overall process. Um, the other thing that frequently happens, and I don't know, it varies from municipality to municipality. Um, some city clerks and town clerks uh, swear in the screening committee as, a, uh, as an official appointed board of, of, the, of the city, um, which I guess has certain implications. Some do, some don't, but you might want to think about that as well. And it typically, it's a matter of the culture of the, the municipality, I think. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Um, did I leave anything out of the screen? You all set? I think. Okay. Uh, the last thing I would, I would uh, give to you or, or point out to you is the candidate profile, um, which you did before, which I think is very well done. And you have some time, if there are changes needed in this, given the interim that has occurred, um, there can be changes made to this, this uh, candidate profile. But as I read it through, I thought it was, it was very nicely done, very concise and succinct, and I, I think it, it says a lot about um, the, uh, the person that you're, you're looking for. So um, again, it's an opportunity to review that. Um, the candidate profile serves a number of purposes. Uh, usually the candidate profile is posted on the school district website, so <coughs> candidates and community can read it and understand what it is you're looking for. It's, it's also the, the um, sort of the framework against which candidates are measured at the screening committee level, uh, in that it translates to, translates to the screening committee, what the school committee is looking for, and ultimately when you folks interview um, it would be the, uh, the framework for your interviews as well, at least in part in terms of knowing in advance the kinds of qualities and characteristics you're looking for in your, your new superintendent. Having gone through those items very quickly, uh, <coughs> we're ready to go as soon as you are. So as soon as the documents are approved, um, we can begin to, uh, to put them out and announce the vacancy. A couple of things I would mention to you. Um, we're planning. Uh, with the search to do a hard copy mailing, which would be about 700 pieces to contacts all over the nation. We're looking also, this wasn't in your, your, your contract with us, but we want to do it for you as long as you agree, and it's at no additional cost to you. Uh, we would like to put an, uh, uh, an announcement in the AASA job bulletin, which was in the original contract. Uh, that's a fee-based uh, advertisement, which we will uh, put in at no cost to the district. <coughs> We'd like to put an announcement in Top School Jobs, which is the electronic version of um, Education Week, again, at no cost to you. And we'd also like to post in School Spring, um, which is uh, a, a, a sort of a, a board, a web board, if you will, announcement uh, process, again, at no cost to you. So with your permission, we would do those three things. Um, I see heads. I'm seeing heads nodding, so okay. thank you. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that we will be doing is we will be putting the announcement once it is approved up on our website. Uh, we typically have a link to your website. We'll be posting that announcement on other websites that we have access to across, across the country, actually, uh, as well as with the National School Development Council, which is our national outreach network. Um, and uh, those electronic, uh, uh, and we will also be sending out electronic announcements, and we usually stagger those to keep the announcement fresh. We, we put out a series of them, say, two weeks from now, and another series of them two weeks following that. So that the outreach is, is going to be, I think, pretty extensive. Um, and we hope that, uh, and we're, we're pretty confident that we can, we can attract a, a, a good applicant pool for you. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions or help you with anything that, uh, Are there any uh, questions for Dr. Bettencourt? Um, I guess I was, I, it, it seems like we're entering a very um, busy uh, 
uh, it'll be a very busy hiring season just from reading about lots of vacancies. Um, I assume you're conducting many other searches or have other searches that you'll be conducting. Um, is that, I mean, is that, is this an atypical, uh, what you're seeing out there, or is this uh, just the natural ebb and flow in terms of, of turnover? No, it's not atypical. I mean, there's there's been a lot of turnover for years, and there are a lot of interims. I, I don't know, 18, 19 interims, I think, in place in Massachusetts alone. We, we work throughout New England. So when you look at the vacancies in Massachusetts, and you say, oh my gosh, there are a lot of vacancies. We look at it from the New England perspective and say, oh my gosh, there are a lot of vacancies. Uh, and there are. Um, but we've been, we've been very successful at attracting uh, talent. And, and one of the things I would suggest you, you would keep in mind, and, and the statement that uh, Ms. Pick uh, mentioned uh, or brought up a, a little while ago about the, the language about previous superintendent experience being preferred, um, we would suggest that you'd want to at least uh, in, your, in your thinking have some flexibility around that issue because the fact of the matter is there are some very, very highly qualified uh, very talented people who have never been a superintendent of schools but have worked in, in school districts um, and have really, I think, learned their trade well. Um, and what we're seeing more and more of, and, and um, to a one, I think there's success. I haven't, I haven't heard of any that have, and I, I could be wrong, but I, I don't think I'm, I'm aware of any that haven't been successful. A lot of principals are moving directly from a principalship into a superintendency. Um, it's not always done, and it's it's not an easy. I made I made that transition, and I, I know from personal experience it's difficult. But for a person who is the right person for your community, the a person who understands you and can relate to you well, uh, and and has the, the sort of the uh, the background and and the the uh, the uh, the expertise, the areas of expertise that you're looking for, that can be a, a very good bet, particularly since uh, in Massachusetts in particular, you have such a strong opportunity to mentor young talent coming into these positions. Uh, Mass Association of School Superintendents has made a real commitment to helping these folks out and, and to supporting them. Um, and and they, they do it well. Um, we do it as well. Um, and so there are, there are ways to offer some of these up and coming uh, really good prospects and opportunity and give them the support mechanism they need and commit to their development in your position as you as you move forward. So I suggest to you that you might want to keep that thought open um, as you as you look at candidates. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much for coming this evening and, uh, and we um, look forward to working with you and um, and look forward to a successful search. Thank you. It's a pleasure, and we look forward to a successful search, too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll now transition into the next item on the agenda, uh, which is a um, presentation of NEF Small Grant Awards. And I believe with us this evening is Dale Melcher from the NEF Board. Those presentations. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's my pleasure to come tonight and recommend the Fall 2013 Small Grant Awards to you for your approval. Um, I have been on the Small Grant Committee since it began, so it really is my pleasure for the first time as a board member of the NEF to present these. Um, I believe you have in front of you the list of grants. I want to remind you that the Education Foundation has two small grant cycles now, the fall cycle and the spring cycle. So this year we are recommending a total of uh, 12 grants for uh, $21,088 in total and we're very proud of that amount. So what I'd like to do is just <coughs> you know, read through the titles and the amounts and the schools and then ask for your approval for this. So the first grant goes to Bridge Street School Garden Project. It's the second year of that project and the amount is $2,000, which is the limit for first and second year grants. 
The second grant uh, also goes to Bridge Street School, Inspiring and Creating More, capital M-O-R-E. Young Writers, again, a second year grant. The third grant, once more, goes to Bridge Street School. It's called Celebrate the World, and it also is a second year grant and for $2,000. Uh, the fourth grant goes to uh, RK Finn, Ryan Road School. It is called Lights, Camera, Read, and the amount of that grant, a first year grant, is $600. The fifth grant is for a hooping program for Jackson Street School. Again, a first year grant in the amount of $1,500. The next grant goes to Leeds. Um, it is a program <coughs> called Rehabilitated Gardens. It is year three of the grant, and that award is for $1,000. The next grant um, goes to all of the elementary schools. It's a project called Training for VINs Volunteers in K through five Literacy Support. It is the second year of this grant and the award is $2,000. The next set of grants go to the high school. The first one is for an AP English mock exam program, year one of that grant for $2,000. The next is the Northampton Robotics First Team Devil Bots. It's the second year of this grant, again for $2,000. Also to the high school, uh, Performing Ibsen, first year of this grant for $2,000. The next grant is Wall Drawings, Algorithms, and Art. Again, the high school for $2,000, the first year for this grant. And the final grant is called Caught Off Guard Theater Education Peer Health Troop. It's the second year of this grant, and it is also for $2,000. So the Education Northampton Education Foundation seeks your approval of these grants for the fall 2013 grant cycle. Move Moved. approval of the small grants as presented. Second. Second. So there's been a motion um, made and seconded. Um, are there any uh, questions or comments about the motion? I'd like to say uh, thank you to NEF. Um, you know, I had the privilege, I know David and uh, Howard also had the privilege of serving on the board, and, and we know the dedication that um, all the members have, um, and the community as well, to, to donate to uh, NEF and, um, and to take the time to really look at these applicants and, and give the money to back to the schools. It's, it's really helpful uh, as a teacher to be able to see uh, this kind of creativity get supported. Um, and I've had my own kids, I've had friends' kids who have benefited from this over the years. And it's just an amazing uh, thing in Northampton. We're just very grateful for the support and generosity of the community and the NEF. Yeah. Thank you very much. And can I just comment on the support and generosity of the community and remind you all that there are some hours left for Valley Gives Day and that the Northampton Education Foundation is one of the choices for Valley Gives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, all those in favor uh, of gratefully accepting this, uh, this, uh, these NEF grants say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? Okay. So it's unanimous. Thank you, Dale, and thank you, NEF. Um, Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda uh, is a uh, requested vote for approval of a teacher sabbatical. Um, and I will turn this over to the superintendent. Right. Um, we did receive this year a request for a sabbatical. It's from Suzanne Strauss, who's an English teacher, an English teacher at uh, Northampton High School. Um, in doing some research on this, we could not find the last time that anyone had asked for a sabbatical uh, in the school district. Uh, we could. How long ago was that? Almost 20 years. Oh. Um, so as I as I said, we did do some research and did try to find out, um, just for historical purposes, when the last time. Uh, anyone sought one. I think it's safe to say it's not been in recent years. Mm -hmm. um, the teacher's contract does say that all applications have to be in by December 1st. 
This is the only one we've received. Um, and the reason that that's in there, I'm sure, is so that there can be planning um, for the next budget year if indeed sabbaticals are approved. And um, I did send a memorandum out to school committee members with regard to um, the pertinent details in terms of the amount of money that it would cost additionally to have a person on sabbatical. I included um, Ms. Strauss's um, application of what it is she'd be doing during that time. And I did ask her to be present this evening in case any of you had specific questions because I didn't feel that I wanted to be in a position of answering anything that you may ask uh, that I might not even know the answer to. So um, it is before you. It is um, something that you could approve. Um, and your portion of it is in terms of the budgetary um, ramifications of that. So. OK, so we have the memo um, before you. Uh, and again, this is uh, uncharted territory for all of us, mm -hmm. I think. So um, I guess the question would be for uh, purposes of discussion to put the question before the body um, to, to I'd like to make a motion okay to accept the sabbatical for purposes of discussion okay so to approve it to approve it okay so there's been a motion made is there a second second okay great um, discussion so uh, this has nothing to do with the merits of the of the application this has to do with the financial part of it I'm really sorry that Downey's not here tonight because I know that when we were doing um, negotiations, we spent some time talking about um, when we when we went through all the language and we spent some time talking about this and we talked about how um, there hadn't been an issue, nobody had come forward, and nobody would you know we, we wouldn't be able to entertain that anyway because it's not in our budget and it was kind of a it was kind of a given that a teacher might take time to go off and do something very interesting and that we would hold a position but it wouldn't necessarily be for this amount of, of money that we would um, that we would put out extra extra funding for that and I'm really sorry that he's not here because we, we, we did have that discussion. So I'm just, I'm curious, given that we're about to move into budget season, um, for a rationale that will um, make sense to the school committee about why we would do that. I, I would direct that, I think, to Why you would do that? Because uh, I think a couple of reasons. I think number one, uh, is the fact that it's certainly not with, um, it's within the realm that people give sabbatical leaves in school districts. It's usually written into master agreements. It is not always an automatic. There is usually um, two parts to it, one being in terms of does it fit the criteria, and in terms of your master agreement it does. It involves both study and travel. I think the person taking and requesting a sabbatical is looking at both personal um, personal reflection and ability to improve their ability uh, of teaching in the classroom uh, in a subject area in which they're already teaching. Um, and I think it adds to um, the lives of the students that they interview, that they uh, converse with. Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for teachers to broaden their experience and to become better teachers. So I certainly support sabbaticals. The second issue you have to contend with is one of financial. The reason that you have prior dates put into a master agreement so is that if you wish to grant that sabbatical, you have time to build it into your budget for the following year. And that's the reason that you always don't have the early dates. She's looking for the sabbatical for the spring of 2015. So if indeed you were to approve it, then yes, you would have to approve additional funds to go into your budget to cover it. Um, the way it sort of works out is the fact that it, it's a teacher's salary. Um, for a semester, it's 75% of that salary. The difference between what you would pay the teacher and um, what you're actually paying the teacher is a savings, which would go toward the cost of a long-term sub, which unfortunately is always more than what you're saving. 
So in this particular <coughs> instance, uh, you're looking at an additional $11,000 to approve the sabbatical financially. Uh, and it is, uh, at the board level, by contract, it's a financial decision. It's not a decision based on the merits of the proposal because that's my discretion by contract and I do recommend it because it meets the criteria. So your, your decision is based on the financial part of it. Thank you. So, um, and again, this is not personal to Suzanne at all, whom I, I admire as a teacher, and I think this is a, a really interesting um, proposal that she has. So there's nothing about that, but it, it, we're setting a precedent since we haven't really done this in such a very, very long time. Um, so m the concern that I would have is that um, what happens if, um, does this become all of a sudden more viable for other people to think about and will we have more applications and will this become kind of a more standard thing? Do we set a limit about how many sabbaticals we might grant in a given year? What happens if we have so many applying and we have to- It says in your contract that- um, Between them and- there, there is wording in your contract, which I just happen to have with me. <laughs> Um, which speaks to the fact that all of these things, it's three pages worth of criteria um, in terms of the fact that they have to apply by December 1st, so you know exactly how many people you have who are interested. This year it's only one. Um, it also says that if they, they have to make a commitment and sign a contract, that they have to come back and teach for either an additional year or two years, minimal depending on whether it's a year or a semester sabbatical. Um, it also speaks to that no more than 1% of the teaching staff can be on a sabbatical at any given time. That's 1% of all the teachers in Northampton. Um, it says um, how they would be paid. It also says that um, um, they have to file reports twice during the semester with the superintendent as to <coughs> the progress they're making and, and how they're um, using their sabbatical. And if indeed it's not approved by the superintendent what they're doing in any of those reports, they're unsatisfactory, then there's an automatic termination of their leave at any given time. Um, and indeed, if the number of applications exceed 1%, then selection shall be made in accordance with the following principles. One, length of service, preference given to those longest in the service. B, distribution by schools, uh, care being taken that the number from any school should not be comparatively excessive. Three, the nature of the service, provisions being made that the benefits of such leave of absence shall be distributed fairly as possible among all grades, high school and supervisory positions. And D, the needs of the school system. So I think all of those things are taken into consideration and spelled out pretty clearly in your contract. Thank you. Having said that, I mm -hmm. think this is the kind of thing that helps us retain good mm -hmm. staff. Absolutely. It encourages them to go off and do really interesting things to bring it back to our students so that we all benefit from their work and makes being here attractive. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I just feel like we have to ask the financial questions because you're all about to head into budget season. You're not coming with us? <laughs> <laughs> kidding. Um, okay. Um, I just wanted to um, say thank you for recommending to the superintendent. Thank you very much for recommending this. That to me, in the fairness that it is in the contract, and, and as you read it, as it is in the contract, that I think that it would be wonderful for her, for uh, Ms. Strauss to go and to bring back. Um, and I also think, and I agree with um, Ms. Pick, that it is wonderful for the morale. Um, to, and, and to show them that we believe in them. And I think penny wise and pound foolish that I think this is a very good s expenditure of the money. So I'm going to vote for her to go. And how many teachers are there? I and mean, when you're saying 1%, how many teachers do we have? Are we have like 275, so we're talking about two or three? No, I think, I think we have. About two. Know. There's uh, there's about 275. So that's right, about 275. So we're only talking no more than two or three people can go per year at 1%. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments about the request? I would only say that it's a, it's a great opportunity. And, um, you know, uh, 
to, to vote on such a thing um, seems to be a simple matter, especially when you think of um, the experience that a teacher would gain and bring back to the district. Mm -hmm. um, I think as all our discussions become lengthy discussions around this table, it comes down to dollars and the amount of, uh, of funds we have in order to spread around and try to meet the needs of everyone and everything we like to do. And um, those are not easy discussions. And at no time are they, uh, at least when I vote, a reflection of how I personally might feel about something. But in the end, when it comes down to trying to do um, so much with so little for so long that um, it, 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 it sometimes it's, it, it, it becomes um, difficult and misunderstood um, as not being something that um, is important or valuable or a reflection of how uh, someone might feel about the person <laughs> or the activity. So. Um, So I, in, in, in my vote, I, I hope that it, it, it's understood in the way that, <coughs> that I've just tried to make it come across, that's all. Yeah, uh, just one perspective I want to have on this is uh, one of the things about the teaching profession is it can be limiting in terms of personal growth or professional growth. Um, there's really one track if you want to move anywhere in the, in the profession is just moving in administration. There's not a lot of um, different branches you can go. This is an opportunity where uh, it, it does provide teachers an opportunity to expand their own professional learning and to pursue other avenues within the, the field of education. And I think that's one of the things that contributes to job satisfaction. Uh, one of the leading reasons why teaching is a really frustrating job for people um, is that there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of pressure and it feels a lot of ways, there's, a lot of times there's nowhere to go. And uh, I know for me that was actually one factor that, that contributed to me actually leaving the profession was um, I, I needed, I wanted some flexibility. And it, it was very hard in, in my system to have that, to be able to just do something professionally for a semester. And um, so I understand that. Um, that said, I'm actually going to abstain from this because I won't be on the board um, when it comes to budget discussions and I feel like uh, voting for something that's going to put a budget um, burden on the next group um, is not necessarily fair. So I'm going to hold off um, for this one, but I just wanted to weigh in on that one piece about that. Okay. Mr. Moore. I, I think um, one, of our, one of our big projects is, is always try to improve the, um, the quality of our teaching, the quality of our schools, the quality of the education that our students achieve. and. Um, and I, and I think a huge piece of that has to do with, uh, I don't know what you want to say, but the uh, educational environment, sort of the way it feels to be going to work in these schools and going to school in these schools. And I, I think, um, I, I really actually can't think of a thing we could do that would cost this little, that would do this much in terms of um, being able to really raise the, the, the spirit of, of the enterprise. So I think it's um, I think it's actually a really good way to spend the money. Mr. Mm -hmm. Ball. And I just wanted to um, the teacher's been within our district for 16 over 23 years, and if you look at the price over it, we're not really looking at much. If you break it down annually, how much we're actually giving for a benefit. So, I mean, I think that they're worth that. She's definitely worth she's worth it for the climate, for this educational climate. So. Okay. Are there any Move other it. questions or comments about the motion that's on the table? I, I, I would like one, and I, I believe in sabbaticals. I think they're, they're great, but I, I just go back to this. We just had a discussion about how $10,500 was too much to make the lives of some people in the central office a little bit easier. I just don't want to lose sight of that fact. Thank that's you. Fine. So any other questions or comments about this? Okay. Um, so then I'll ask the call the question. All those in favor of the motion, uh, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. All those abstaining. Abstain. Okay. So uh, the motion carries with one abstention. Okay.
I, I would personally like to thank the school committee members for granting um, the sabbatical because not only does it benefit Suzanne and not only does it benefit students, but I think it benefits the entire teacher teaching body of your school district. And I think that's reflected in all of you. So thank you very much for doing that. So the next item on the agenda is the business manager's report and uh, turn it over to Mr. McLaughlin. Again in your package is the business manager's report, although it's uh, short for this past month's worth of activity, does not mean that there's many things going on. There's much going on, but there's not anything to bring to conclusion and report out. So uh, that's the reason for a short report this month. The uh, first part of the report is basically talking about contracts, and I think we've addressed those earlier on in the meeting. In the last part of it talks about financials, and we're in a pretty good spot right at the moment through the uh, first five months of the year. Okay. Any questions uh, for Mr. McLaughlin about the business manager report? Mr. Moore. Um, you know, I think it was at this time of the year, the last couple of years, we've had a budget freeze. Mm -hmm. um, are we contemplating such, and if not, um, what is different about this year than previous years? Um, we have, we did put a budget freeze on last year. Uh, we put it on at the, during the um, middle to the end of December. Um, I think we were in a different spot last year uh, in putting the budget freeze on as early as we did. And it was, um, it was a really uh, wise move to put it on when we did last year because it did uh, um, hold down expenses so things didn't uh, get out of alignment and it became very successful. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm in the process of looking at that now and trying to figure out uh, whether we should put a budget freeze on uh, coming up in, in January or at the first part of February. I need to see where some of the expenses are. We have many expenses that are cyclical, and some of the expenses come on during the first part of the year, and we have some expenses that come on in the latter part of the year. But I do need to review that. I need to discuss that with the superintendent uh, as we look going idea. forward. Okay, any um, other issues with the business report? A personnel report. Personnel report also is, uh, is a fairly short report for the month of November. There are six new hires, uh, five separations uh, from the district, one retirement, and uh, one promotion. Okay, any questions about the personnel report? Okay. Um, Okay, excellent. So that concludes our reports for the evening. Uh, and now we move into um, superintendent. superintendent's report. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I have some really exciting things I think that um, people are doing in this district, and I'm going to try to make them as brief as possible. But uh, Nancy Cheevers, who's our new director of curriculum assess uh, and assessment, has been doing a great job. Um, in one area, she's working with Gwen Agna, who's principal at Jackson Street, and they've been working together to organize a training in Lucy Calkins' Reader's Workshop. Um, we have a group of teachers who have had some training in that in the past. Um, we're putting together um, more extensive work with them, with Jenny Bender, who's our consultant, um, and they're going to be teaching other teachers. Um, it's sort of the train the, train the trainer's model or um, train the teachers model um, and um, the literacy uh, PLC um, group which is composed of teachers in all grade levels K through 5 will finalize the plans for the spring training <coughs> and this work is being supported and paid for through the literacy partnership grant so we're really very excited um, across the district in terms of really doing more training in this area uh, of literacy um, Nancy's also been meeting with all the elementary principals. She has a meeting coming up in January to organize grade level meetings that will last through June. These will be once a month meetings of elementary teachers in grades K through five by grade level. They're going to be meeting in small groups of eight to ten people. 
Um, it will include some special educators as well to discuss topics such as current resources being used in literacy and math and uh, how those might be shared across the four elementary schools, assessment practices in the classrooms, team teaching with ESPs and other areas. Um, these groups will be led by Nancy and a principal in each of the sessions and the intent is to have some commonality of curriculum and assessment across the four elementary schools. These schools all lead into JFK. Uh, it's important that we have some of the same, same sorts of things going on curriculum-wise, assessment-wise, so that when the kids come here, there's a common expectation um, from the teachers in the JFK building as to what they've had in the past. Um, we also had a principal, uh, Gwen Agna, and a teacher in her building, Chris McHugh, um, from Jackson Street, who were asked to present at the DSAC meeting, uh, which was held in Pittsfield a couple of weeks ago. Um, <coughs> presented using <coughs> photographs, artwork, and other artifact, artifacts, uh, which had been created by teachers and students in their building, um, as to what contributes to a successful learning environment. And two areas um, that, that are certainly contributing are parent involvement and a shared responsibility between parents and teachers for the students and their children. Um, the audience was very impressed with the professional environment that was created there for teachers and the positive MCAS scores and other things that were happening in the building. Um, November 20th, uh, here at JFK, we had some visitors. We had Dennis Van Rokel, who's president of the NEA, Paul Toner, who's the MTA president, and Kevin Concannon, who's the U.S. Deputy of Agriculture, the Undersecretary. Uh, they were here to celebrate ESP Day. They were throughout other places in Massachusetts as well. Um, and they were here to mark the um, American Education Week. And JFK was recognized uh, in the MTA um, publication, MTA Today. Nice story and a nice picture. Um, and um, I want to thank um, one of our board members, um, Blue was able to attend that afternoon and uh, it was a very nice ceremony and um, to show appreciation for ESPs uh, on that particular day. Um, I would also say I've, I've been fortunate, I've had the opportunity to meet with each of the three newly elected school committee members. I see one in the audience this evening. Um, and this was an orientation session which we do as part of your board policies. And I'm looking forward to working with them starting in January when they take their seats on the committee. I was very impressed with all three of them. I think they have very definite um, and good reasons to be on the board, and that is they're really concerned about all students. And I can't think of a better reason to be on a school committee. So I, I'm looking forward to working with them. And uh, the last thing is to wish all of you um, a happy holiday, winter break. Um, and I look forward to seeing you have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that report. <coughs> okay. Um, the next item on the agenda uh, is, um, as was mentioned earlier uh, in, in the evening, this will be the final meeting for several of our colleagues um, uh, who will be leaving the school committee at, this, at the end of this term. Um, so we wanted to uh, recognize those members and um, and so um, we've uh, put together uh, a special recognition for each one of them and I was going to um, present the more formal piece of that to, to each of the members and then the vice chair was going to um, add some additional comments so uh, we've created a City of Northampton Certificate of Special Recognition. Um, this one is awarded to Alden Bourne uh, for his four years of service as a member of the school committee, uh, January 2010 to December 2013. And this is signed by uh, myself and by um, uh, Dr. Nash. And then we also have a um, small token of uh, our affection <laughs> for you. Uh, so I'll give this to you, Mr. Bourne. Thank you for your In Mr. Bourne's four years with us, he, um, of the three leaving us, he's our most um, uh, 
our, sh our shortest termer, if you will, with four years. He's managed to find his way onto each of our three subcommittees. Um, he's also been on our conference committee. Uh, he is our legislative liaison. Uh, he's been on superintendent search committee and, uh, and on the superintendent evaluation team. So um, in his four years, he certainly has accomplished a lot. And um, uh, we wish him luck in the future. Uh, in talking to him via email earlier, I guess it was last week, I had asked each member just to uh, do a little reflection for me. And, and I recall uh, this little piece that he shared with me a couple years ago. Um, we formed kind of, a, kind of a, a book club, if you remember, uh, and it was on Alden's recommendation. He had come across the book, the Essential School Board Book, and for a, a few meetings, we actually um, reflected on the chapters, the reading that we did. We had uh, discussions around um, how we as a board could function better, and uh, it helped us make some changes in how we conduct our, our business and our meetings. Um, and it's evident in every meeting we have, um, we have a consent agenda now. We get information ahead of time. It's a way to kind of mainstream our meeting so that some of those things that we approve monthly that come before us could be done in a more timely manner so we could spend more time discussing things of um, not necessarily greater importance but of items that might involve a, a more lengthy discussion. So as we reflect back on Alden, um, certainly he'll remember and I will as well that wonderful contribution in that time we shared um, with the Essential School Board book and how it's helped shape our, our group and how we conduct our meetings. So thank you very much. Thanks. And the um, <coughs> next uh, certificate of recognition um, goes to uh, Michael Flynn for his eight years as a member of the Northampton School Committee beginning in January 2006 to December 2013. So, Michael, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Going up that ladder in years, so uh, Mike Flynn's been with us for eight years, and I guess I should have said before I started talking about Alden that um, I always worry about making comments about the things that people did because it, it's a list that's been compiled by me or with the help of others, but undoubtedly I, we always miss something. So in the things that I say, um, it's not a, uh, that the thing that I didn't mention wasn't important. It was just overlooked or forgotten, so forgive me. But I do know that Mike has, he's served on two of our three uh, subcommittees, budget and property and curriculum. Spent, um, as far as I recall, all his time on curriculum as I believe it's probably his expertise. Um, and talking to him this week, um, you know, uh, he shared with me uh, just his, his um, ability to bring to this group uh, his great knowledge of education, um, and he does that from various perspectives. He's had a very successful career as a young man and, um, you know, from a classroom teacher to a professional development provider, a professor in teacher education and as a, um, an advocate for education policy, not only at the state but at the uh, national level as well. Uh, those contributions to our board have been uh, of great assistance and of great value. Not to mention that he has four children here in Northampton Public Schools and as I is a, um, a proud graduate of Northampton High School. So thank you very much, Mike. And our final uh, departing member is uh, Stephanie Pick. Spedpack liaison. Oh, Spedpack liaison. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this evening we uh, we recognize Stephanie Pick for her 12 years as a member of the Northampton School Committee, January 2002 uh, to December 2013. So 12 years, that's, um, you know, that's a, a, an entire school experience for many of our students that come through Northampton Public Schools. And speaking of that, she has had two, uh, uh, children who have come through and have graduated from Northampton Public Schools. Uh, <coughs> she's currently our second longest member on the board with 12 years experience and, and time in. Uh, she served on all three of our subcommittees, Budget and Property, Curriculum, Rules and Policy. In her early years on Rules and Policy, uh, she worked at revamping the uh, policy manual. Um, She's chaired, as I think we heard earlier uh, tonight, three superintendent search committees. She's served four years as our vice chair on the school committee. Um, she's been part of the conference committee, negotiating committee, 
um, super and value, superintendent evaluation team. And I guess if you spend so much time on the committee, you, you find your way into all these different roles. I think one of the things that I talked to her uh, more than one occasion about is um, how successful this last negotiation uh, went with our um, with with our um, our employees here in the Northampton Public Schools. Um, it was the first time that we were able to have negotiations um, separate without uh, the need to bring in any uh, lawyers during that negotiation process. And it's something that um, I think can be a model for other districts and something that uh, I know that everyone who was part of uh, the negotiating committee can be proud of, especially you, Stephanie. So thank you so much for your service. Um, and, and lastly, I just kind of put some, just a, a brief ref reflection um, together. So if you could just uh, give me a moment as I uh, share some thoughts, uh, just in general about public service. I was thinking um, just most recently, we observed 50 years since the assassi assassination of our 35th president, uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, and I was reminded that uh, one of his most famous quotes, if you recall, was, not ask what your country can do, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And um, I think this quote, as we sit around this table tonight, helps remind us all of um, the reason why we got into public service. As an elected official, each one of us daily is reminded that our work has the ability to impact the lives of nearly 3,000 young people as well as those who seek to educate them, feed them, and support them. Our personal values of honesty, fairness, respect, and compassion are tested as we do our very best to make decisions that will benefit those who elected us, as well as the children of this community. But balancing the needs of an entire district is difficult, and each one of us, at some point, most likely has made a mistake, as no one person is perfect. This is an unavoidable consequence of constantly having to make decisions, tough ones. These tough choices result, uh, these tough choices result not being able, uh, with us not being able to please everyone. And this can be tough, for we're all connected to the people that we serve. You know, you see them in the grocery store, at the gym, downtown, at your place of worship. Some of these people celebrate the choices that we make while others take issue with what we've done. But this, my friends, is public service. At times, a thankless job, but an essential job to our community. It's a job that I believe each human being who is part of a city or town should consider being part of at some point. And so, to those who've answered the call to public service, Michael, Alden, Stephanie, as a resident of Northampton and as your vice chair of this committee, I say thank you to each one of you. Thank you for your commitment to doing your very best each day, for taking this job so very seriously and for striving to make decisions in the best interest of all of Northampton. So once again, thank you. And obviously, I would want to allow our departing comments, uh, colleagues to make any comments that they wanted to, so. It shouldn't come as a surprise that okay. I've prepared something. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised if I hadn't, right? So, no big surprise that after 12 years, I have something to say. I'm not good at ad-libbing, so I'm going to read from this, so forgive me for that. Leaving has become an opportunity to step back and reflect, and I'd like to share just a tad of what I've been thinking about lately. This has been an incredibly enriching and rewarding experience for me. Serving on this committee for three terms has been a privilege and a terrific learning experience. I started when my own children were in elementary school and I was looking for a way to serve my community and to be more connected to their educational process. With an encouraging nudge from then Principal Gail Fer Furman, I dove in, and 12 years later, I have no regrets. I have served alongside dedicated and invested colleagues, mayors, and superintendents. We have watched budget seasons come and go. We have made some very good decisions and have apologized for others, 
It's very important to know when to say we're wrong and to reconsider. And it's as though we wrote together. I have watched us become more and more transparent with some help from the open meeting law, but more because we know it's best to include all invested parties in the decision-making process for our district. We can tell the difference because more people now understand the issues and the choices we have to make, and they engage with us more as partners in the process. I have also appreciated as we've grown a more comprehensive pre-K through 12 perspective, rather than any less of a collaborative approach to serving our students. What do I take most pride in? Look at our class sizes. That's noteworthy because in spite of year after year of horrendous budget cuts, we have held what happens in the classroom as our highest priority. And marvel at what we did in negotiations this past year. That was history in the making. We had two school committee members and a superintendent actually sit at the same table with representatives for all of our unions at once without lawyers and negotiated a contract. It's a real far cry from what it looked like 12 years ago. We had the start of meaningful conversations and began the hard work of establishing respectful and trusting relationships. Do everything you can to stay on that path. But there's some self-evaluation that needs to recur here. We spend an excessive percentage of our meeting time debating the fine points of the budget and not nearly enough time discussing learning, curriculum, and district goals. We have tried all manner of meeting configurations, but seem to be at our most dilute, dilute version right now. I suggest that when you meet next month, you decide if you're going to reestablish subcommittees that meet regularly, or if you're going to have twice monthly full board meetings with ample time reserved to discuss the educational concerns that you are here to support and advocate for. We have unique and diverse learning happening in our buildings, and this committee needs to understand more about that so that you can make the best decisions as you move forward. There was a time when a presentation of testing results or school improvement plans led to meaty and thorough conversation. I encourage you to move in that direction again. We have a district full of phenomenal administrators, teachers, and staff. They do so very much for our students and families and for each other every day. It's the job of this committee to support them in their work, to provide them with what they need, to debate and decide how best to further their efforts. Why there aren't more people who choose to run for this office is beyond me. Why, in a community where so many people care about the decisions that are made at this table, are there so few who come forward to serve? Whether or not you have, will have, have had children in our schools, what happens in those buildings enriches this whole community. This is a fabulous and incredibly rewarding way to serve. I hope more people will choose to come forward in future years. As you all know, I could go on and on, but after 12 years, it's my turn to stop. And so I wish good luck to those of you veteran and new as you pursue the work of making best decisions for the Northampton schools. Choose a fabulous new superintendent, change the start time at the high school, keep your wits as you head into another budget season, and remember that everything you do is for the benefit of children's learning. If educators can affect a child for a lifetime, then think how grand your role is that supports them in doing just that. Thank you. Well said. Nice. Thank you. She's very well, inspirational. Also not come to a surprise that I'll be very brief. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like to be brief, um, and I'll also go off the cuff because uh, it's also how I roll. So we're very different. <laughs> um, but I'll just so say this: yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I just want to say, like, I got on this uh, for two reasons. One, because I was mildly curious about how school systems work as a teacher, I wanted to see what it looked like from the other side. And two, I naively thought I could fix it. Like, I, I, I knew as a teacher, I'd come in and. And these people who didn't get it, um, would, I'd teach them something and we'd, we'd figure everything out. And you, you learn really quickly that this is a complex system and there's a lot of moving parts and there are no quick fixes, there are no easy solutions to these problems. Um, but what I did discover uh, was that there are a lot of really good, uh, intelligent, dedicated people at every aspect of this system who is dedicated to working for the best uh, for students. And that's, that's what I take away from this, is seeing not just the board members and the various board members, every board member has been very diverse, 
but they've all had this common drive to make Northampton a really successful school district. But then meeting administrators and lots of administrators over the years, teachers, ESPs, food service personnel, custodians, everyone that we've had a chance to interact with on some level, whether we're doing school visits, they're coming here to talk to us. <coughs> sometimes we're making decisions where they cheer, sometimes we've been booed, um, but we're all in this together, and I think even stepping away here, um, as a community, we're all in this together. And I think that if, as long as we all remember that, and that um, collectively we can, over time, solve these complex issues, and, and it's worth it. And um, like Stephanie, I encourage everyone to get involved in some way. And uh, I encourage a lot more people to consider running for this. Uh, it's, it's been an experience I cannot uh, I, I can never replicate it anywhere else. I learned so much from this position, and I take away so much personally and professionally as a result of it. And I will miss coming here, believe it or not, as, as much as I, I can't wait to be home and watching you all on TV, maybe, but um, uh, I, but I will miss this. I'll miss the interaction, um, and uh, you'll probably see me on, on the other side of that podium sometimes, especially when you start talking about math. But thank you all for the, uh, the time and the experience, and I wish you all the best. Uh, Ed mentioned that uh, book, the Essential School Board book, and I do need to remind people that David was the one who uh, suggested that book to me. I didn't mention it that much originally because I think you were running for mayor at the time, so it seemed like <laughs> too much of a plug. We're trying to disassociate. But, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sketchy guy. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I would just want to pick up on what Mike was saying about. It. I would really encourage more people to run for school committee. It's amazing how many people when I talk to them about running, they say, uh, oh, it sounds great, but I just don't have the time. And I don't think any of us really have the time to do it, but we just have done it somehow. So um, I can't say it's always been enjoyable to be on the school committee, but I'll say it's always felt worthwhile. Um, and um, I guess one thing that just uh, really resonates with me having served on the committee is that um, I'd say I haven't always agreed with all of you, but I've always been really impressed by how committed each and every one of you are to um, the kids at Northampton, so that's it. Thank you. Do other members have any comments to add? Uh, Good okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, can, I, can I say just sure. two words? Sure. I really have said all my life there are three jobs I would never want to do school bus driver, substitute teacher, and school committee member. <laughs> <laughs> and coming here to Northampton in the position I hold, I now serve on a school committee. And I have to say my hats are off to all of you. Because I always thought, why is it that school committee members cannot read all their materials before the meeting? I now understand why. <laughs> that it's very difficult, it's time consuming, you all have other lives, you all have work responsibilities and family responsibilities. And my hat is off to anyone who's able to serve and serve as well as all of you have for the length of time that you've been on the committee. And I just personally want to thank each and every one of you, although I've only been here a short time. Um, you certainly are committed. Um, you certainly are thinking of the best interest of children, and you can't ask for anything more than that when you serve on a school committee. So thank you. Ms. Minnick. I, I think, I don't want to single anyone out, I just, but I do want to wish, I, I just want to say thank you to each of you and wish you a, very, a, a great deal of success in whatever it is that you choose to do beyond this and after this. And we have really appreciated your your service and your input and your friendship. So thank you for, for being there with us. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all again for your service on behalf of the city, the largest city at, at large. And um, uh, we know where to find you, though. You have a, a lot. We're losing a lot of experience, the three of you. So uh, we hope you'll stay engaged in the community in other ways. And um, if you get uh, if you start to miss having a regular meeting, I hope you'll please <laughs> volunteer to serve on another committee uh, in the city. I'd be happy to appoint any of you to something like Handling a screening committee yeah. shortly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, with that, do we, I don't believe we have any new business scheduled for this evening. Um, obviously our uh, next official um, 
business meeting, a regular meeting, will not be until January 9th, and that'll be the new members of the, the new newly inaugurated school committee. Um, and for the members of the public, um, the inauguration this year will be on Monday, January 6th, um, and it's currently going to be scheduled for 7 p.m. Um, at the Northampton Senior Center. Um, uh, previous, the previous charter specified 10 a.m. in the morning, um, which is what always bound us to that sometimes difficult having to do that the first day back from school vacation at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so um, in talking to um, the city council president, given the new flexibility of not having a time, we decided we'd try to do something in the evening that might be more convenient, not only for the members and their families, but also for the public to be able to attend. So. Um, so we um, look forward to that happening and uh, invite the public to attend. So with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The meeting is adjourned.